Yeah, many thanks and uh, thanks for the invitation. Of course, it's not so easy uh, intervening after the presentation of Bob Harrison, and uh, he challenged us on a new way of thinking, on innovation. Uh, representing the network of Ministry of Education, I will be a little bit more traditional, while uh, I will try to highlight more issues linked to the innovation. And one of the main challenges we all have is not to use technology, is, uh, is more how to transform successful use of technology within mainstreaming dimension at the level of uh, in, uh, education systems more globally. So today, I would like to share with you three major elements in this presentation. The first one is sharing with you some issues regarding the integration of ICT in schools in Europe. And I will refer to some survey studies we made for the European Commission on ICT in schools. I will, I will also exchange with you on the iTech project, and Estonia is quite an active partner in the iTech project, trying to, uh, from the iTech element, uh, trying to share with you and see how complex innovation processes are. And finally, uh, reflect and exchange on innovation and mainstreaming on education with a particular focus on what the teacher of the 21st century should be. So moving now to the issues of the integration of ICT in schools, I'd like to take, and you all know Michael Fullan, who is one of the most worldwide experts linked to public policies, and in his last book, Stratosphere, he was saying that school boredom is no chance against the adaptive draw of the outside world. And more importantly, within school, technology is visible by its absence or by its superficial ad hoc use. Of course, that's quite an easy statement because we are looking at what happens in the school. But, from now, from, but now on, the issue is not only the in-school processes, the issue is in and out school learning processes where we all have to look at it. But taking this and looking at the result of the survey in schools, ICT in education, if you look at the situation of the use of ICT within the classes, except two countries where the use is around approaching around once a week, which are uh, Denmark and Norway, and Estonia is not bad placed, but the student's use of ICT during lessons is not yet on a weekly basis in all our European countries. So that's a fact. It doesn't mean that technology is not at the center of the learning processes, but the way to use technology within the class is not so easy to achieve. Moving more on an element is what type of resources are used by teachers during the class? And then you have in the slide different type of resources. And the survey, that's a randomized survey, more than 150,000 pupils uh, uh, being interviewed, more than uh, 15,000 schools and head of schools, so quite representative in terms of significance. And then we see that the ma main resources used remain multimedia tools such as PowerPoints. And that's used in 65% of cases. But more interestingly, the more advanced resources, such as data logging tools, simulation, learning games, uh, video games, in more than 70% of cases, they are never used. Absolutely never used by teachers. So the question is then, how can technology help engage learning? And that's certainly one of the major challenges all our education system have. And there are, in fact, three major innovation challenges. And the first one is certainly to have innovative teachers. But having innovative teachers, and Bob Harrison mentioned that the teacher is a vector change, is at the center of the teaching and learning processes, is not enough. We must have also innovative school, which means having head of schools fully engaged in the change and the development of the strategic plan of the school, a global approach. But that's not enough. We also must have innovative education systems. And we discussed the issues on curricula, and I will not mention all the challenges in Europe concerning the STEM curricula, 
where more and more things are overstuffed and piled up, where nothing is removed from the curricula. And we asked all STEM teachers to do miracles in all countries in Europe. And then we're surprised that there is a disinterest of young people for taking up STEM studies. So try to find the mistake on that. But quite interestingly, the innovation in school education is really a complex process. And if you look at our education systems, generally they are based around three main pillars. The first one is the teaching processes, second one is the curriculum, and the third one is the assessment. Of course, in some countries, assessment is dealt in a different way. On top of that, we have all the governance issues linked on the margin of flexibility, the margin of maneuvers that the school institutions may have within its educational system. And the innovation comes generally more from the potential adoption of innovation, either from pedagogy or from technology. And then if we try to see how both interact, you may have certainly flipped classroom, self-directed learning, in-out school learning processes, which impact on the teaching processes. And there are quite a lot of teachers absolutely innovative in that area. Of course, it can impact also on the autonomy and the flexibility left at the school level for defining part of the curriculum. And there are quite a lot of countries, even I'm coming from France, which is famous for its centralized system, with, even within in France, there's quite a lot of margin left at the level of the school with a certain percentage of adaptation of the curriculum. If we continue on that, technology, of course, and we mentioned on the teaching process, interactive whiteboards, one-to-one -one approach, tablets, mobile learning, bring your own device, all these elements are part of the daily life of the school and the teachers. Looking at the curriculum, and it has not been mentioned so much today, one of the major challenges is the transformation of the classic textbooks within the digital books and the challenge to reconciliate on one side all the open educational resource community with the commercial publisher activities as well. And that's certainly a key challenge for all our education systems. And we have a tendency to oppose one with the other whereas the solution may be to combine one with the other. Last element is assessment. E-exam, use of laptop, access to internet during exams. How many countries in Europe have already put into place specific arrangements on that? Do you have any idea? Is there any pilot projects? Denmark is quite advanced. They use laptop in exams. There has been a pilot project for having access to internet <laughs> to exams, which changed radically the way our assessment systems works. And when we look at all what is going on in our education systems in Europe, we work quite a lot on the teaching processes, we work quite a lot on the curriculum, but we still keep a middle-aged assessment system. And if things have to be changed, certainly more emphasis should be done and, and looked at how our assessment models could be changed. Finally, of course, the technology can impact on the administration and uh, I'm very pleased to see the cloud learning computing strategy which has been decided by Finland and Estonia and that's certainly a major challenge for the future. So, all of that only to show that innovation is quite a complex process. And generally speaking, that's quite di difficult uh, because when you launch some innovation, the main difficulty you have in any education system, when it works, you don't know how to mainstream it. But when it does not work, more challenging, you don't know how to stop it. Which is also quite preoccupying at all the level of our countries. So, moving now on the experience of iTech. iTech is one of the major European cooperation projects funded by the European Commission via European Schoolnet. We have 14 ministries of education working in iTech. iTech stands for Innovative Technology for an Engaging Classroom. We all like the acronyms in the Brussels world. And the major element on the iTech vision was how can we connect to current stakeholder practice? How can we define activities which will impact on schools? And how can we achieve 
system-wide change. The main objective of iTech was to be able to engage our Ministry of Education with mainstreaming activity at the end of the iTech process. We have been funded for more than for four years. We arrived to the last year of operation, and we worked a lot on future classroom scenario, and that's the most important large pilot experimentation we ever conducted in Europe, where we managed 2,000 classes from more than 14 different countries. And the major iTech approach was around the famous debate we all have, where should we put the focus on, pedagogy or technology? Who should drive that? And that's the type of things where we considered that if you put the pedagogy right and incorporate technology accordingly, learning will become easier, deeper, and more engaging. And from time to time, we were in a situation in the last 10 years where we were more conducted or driven by technology and now change has to take place where pedagogy has to be considered and technology has to be looked accordingly. More element on the triptych is teachers and students. And the main important element is never think of technology without worrying about teachers. That's teachers with technology which will make the difference with the students, which immediately calls upon professional development of teachers. How many whiteboards have been installed in some countries, and I will not name the, the countries, it's not Estonia, where there has been absolutely no money left for looking at the training of teachers and how to use it. Some other countries, Flanders, for example, put very interesting approaches where the students was go were going to train the teachers on how to use an interactive whiteboard as a co-construction process, and it worked very well. Moving now on the difficulty of innovation, more or less we always have three gaps innovation, and that's what we experimented within the iTech project. First, that's a policy gap. Whatever we decide to do, even if that's a prescriptive level, at the level of our education system, so we need to have willing adopters at the level of the class, at the level of the teachers. And that's quite important. How many reforms, how many decisions taken by the central level have never been put into place at the school level? Quite a lot. The second element is the identification gap. Because the all innovation is absolutely difficult to identify because in a lot of cases that's process integrated and that's quite difficult to be observed. And there is a lack of communication also between the various teams, which makes that quite difficult. And the last element is the evidence gap, where we have to question how to evaluate and when. And it's quite difficult to decide on these two elements, which makes innovation processes extremely complex. Moving now on the innovation aspect, I mentioned the three elements of innovative teachers, innovative school, innovative systems, but I'd like to focus more now on three main challenges of innovation in education. First one being the governance of innovation. Second one would be more on the training and the pre-service and uh, in-service training of teachers. And finally, sharing with you some elements linked to mainstreaming processes. On the governance of education, the current situation in most of our countries was that the central level was more there to validate the conformity, to look at compliance and regulation, to give instruction to schools on how to operate. It's going to change. That's not now the role of the central level. It's going to change to provide support to schools, to look at flexibility, to support schools in a differentiated manner to make their choices. So which means innovation takes place as well at the central level in how innovation is governed. And all of that is linked to taking the necessary change at the level of the governance process where two main elements have to be looked at. First, the accountability element, and the second one, the assessment element. That's quite important. Moving now to the teacher training for the 21st century. We all know from uh, UNESCO that it's a quantitative challenge. There are three million missing teachers all over the world. 
But that's also a challenge at the European level. We have 60% of teachers which are more than 40 years old. If we go more on the statistics, there are one third of teachers which are more than 50 years old. In some countries, there are more than 50%, such as Germany and Italy. I heard in the previous presentation some issues on maths teachers in Estonia. And we have a lot of vocation issues in the STEM area as well. More preoccupying also, the retention rate. How many teachers decide to give up the teaching profession after three years, if you look at some countries? So which is the teacher element, the teacher profession, is a profession we should uh, pay particular attention. But we also have the qualitative challenge. We need to train efficient professionals. And the, the profession of teachers today is not the profession of teachers 20 years or 30 years ago. If you remember, there is al always a story, you all know David Putnam, one uh, famous film producer, very engaged in uh, education and education in technology. He always takes the example to say, if you take a surgery in the 20s, which was absolutely well, world known in the hospital, and you ask this surgery of the 20s to come in a hospital now, it will be completely lost. It will not be able to do anything. And immediately, you can imagine that Putnam makes the comparison if you take a teacher in the 20s and you put the teacher in a school now, will the teacher be lost or not? But David Putnam say, no, he will not be lost. I'm not so sure regarding the, that's not because Bob Harrison made a plea for being more acquainted with all technology. I think things have changed, not as, as quickly as in other sectors, but the way school is developing has changed in a very significant way. But in order to meet this teacher training for the 21st century, ICT support has to be looked at. How can ICT help for facing the quantitative and qualitative challenge for teachers? If we look at the teacher of the 21st century, we, we must have teachers able to represent ideas in a powerful way. Teachers which are able to be more active on assessment activities, to evaluate, to organize productive learning processes. So, which means that we have to develop teacher competence. And this teacher competence, first of all, are the subject knowledge. And that was the representation of the teachers of 30 or 40 years ago. We wanted to have a teacher which was absolutely skilled in its subject knowledge. But that's not enough. We need now to have teachers which, is, which are more linked to be able to assess competence, which are also able to define learning conditions design, and also to have n better knowledge about students. And that's more on the differentiated approaches which were mentioned previously. Looking at that, the main question is how to use technology to get there. And if you look at that, of course, we have on all online videos, data logging tools, there are plenty of elements now which are at the disposal of the teacher for supporting the subject knowledge activities. All the digital self-assessment, interactive whiteboards, response systems, all ways of assessing things are quite important in the teaching process of the teachers. Of course, flipped classroom scenario, collective learning elements for the learning condition designs are there as well. And finally, learning analytics, big data, online surveys are elements which are penetrating progressively the school environment. You all know Sir Ken Robinson, do you? Yeah, you all watch on the marvelous speech on TED of Sir Ken Robinson. In November 2013, he came to France to make a presentation and a journalist asked a question to Sir Ken Robinson. If you had a 5% annual increase in your, the education budget of France, which represents 2.5 billion euro out of 46 billion euro, France has around 800,000 teachers, what should be done? Any idea on the answers? Teacher professional development. 
teacher professional development of teachers on three areas. Creative approaches to teaching and learning. So, things out of the box, as it is mentioned in our previous presentation. Teaching and learning with digital technology. And more importantly, personalizing student assessment. If investment were targeted on professional development in these areas, it could have a huge impact on teaching, learning, and achievement in schools. That's not an issue of investing in infrastructure. That's not an issue of having the Wi-Fi in schools. That's, that's an issue of being able to work now with technology. The survey of schools, again, that's our Bible for the time being, we, we got some very interesting elements. We asked teachers and we discovered that teachers, more than 70% of teachers in Europe, decide to invest on their own time, outside of any continuing professional development scheme, in order to get acquainted on how to use ICT in their teaching, which comes as a very, very good surprise, as a readiness and the momentum is there. The willingness of teachers to invest and to get access to the appropriate continuing professional development activities is there. And also there is an untapped potential which is linked to the participation of all teachers in teacher communities. Which means a lot, in a lot of cases we criticize teachers as being old-fashioned, not necessarily taking the opportunity of technology. That's not the case. Teachers are extremely connected and are exchanged quite a lot on all those elements. Coming to the mainstreaming issue, how can we succeed from a few too many for getting everyone involved? And you all know these famous graphs, you know, the Gauss curve, and then you have the pioneers at the beginning on the technology comfort, and that's where European School Network worked a lot in the last 15 years. We were extremely privileged because we were working in the ICT bubble. We were working with convinced teachers the one we didn't have to convince. They were mature teachers in the use of technology. Of course, you have the unwise people, the neophyte on the other side. But what is more important is here are the practitioners. And that's where we have to focus our efforts. That's the transformers. That's the one which makes things possible at the level of our systems. So we really have to work on it. We just launched at European Schoolnet the concept of European Schoolnet Academy based on this famous MOOC principle. And the objective was more to offer teachers a possibility to share added value from our projects. We opened a future classroom lab demonstrating what can be done with technology. We organized a lot of face-to-face -face training sessions. Don't hesitate to liaise for the teachers with your retraining national support structure because via training you can attend some courses in the future classroom lab. But with all the money we can have, there are 6 million teachers in Europe, we can only welcome 600 teachers globally in a year. So we saw a possibility to share value from the development of online courses. So we developed that within our ministries and we, host also, we offer also to some ministry to host online courses via this platform which can be customized for national needs. And we offer different courses for teachers and head of schools. Of course, that's free. And that's online activities, more based on the connectivist model rather than the classic transmissive one. And we open two courses, one on future classroom scenario, second one being on STEM attractiveness and how to teach STEM within the current environment. So that's an experiment. We try to do that because there is a lot of demand from teachers for being connecting, exchanging, on how they can progress all together. Of course, the second phase will be to work more on learning analytics and to see how we can learn more from this community of teachers. More than 2,500 teachers are participating in the future classroom scenario. More than 1,500 STEM teachers in Europe are participating and exchanging on STEM teaching. So that's only an opportunity to disseminate large-scale European projects, to design technology solutions, and to contribute to the development of new teacher training model. How could we integrate technology and pedagogy? 
in teaching and learning processes because it's part of the, the I'm seeing Margus telling me lunch is ready to be served, but I ensure you five minutes I will have finished. But to be honest, looking at the length of other presenters, I don't feel guilty even speaking another 10 minutes. So, <laughs> looking at the four criteria integrating technology and pedagogy, the first one is it has to be irresistibly engaging for students and teachers. And that's quite important. And I noticed the issue mentioned as interactive whiteboard as any direct link to the increase of learning outcomes. And it has been questioned, do, do, did you find any good research all worldwide on that? And the answer was no. My question is, is it a type of research to be looked at? Is it what research should do to look at interaction of technology with learning outcomes? Did you see any research telling the importance of technology for fighting against dropout and keeping students engaged in learning? So what should we tell the research to do as well? That's certainly an issue we all have to question. And that's also maybe to think also out of the box on what should be the research agenda as well. Second element, it has to be efficient and easy to use. The third criteria is should be technology ubiquitous. Now, more than 50% of the knowledge of students is acquired outside of the school walls. And that's a fact. And that's up to the teachers to, pro to change the way he looks and he works with the students. 30 years ago, that was not the case. Now, all students have a marvelous access to information. Access to information doesn't necessarily mean access to knowledge. But anyway, 50% of the knowledge is acquired outside of the school. And finally, all of that has to be steeped in life problem solving. And that's certainly one of the major elements linked to STEM teaching. More importantly, don't focus on technology, but focus on its purposeful use. Diana Loria, working at the Institute of Education London, said, whenever you use technology, interrogate every technology for its potential use to serve educational aims. That's absolutely essential. Maybe some mistakes we did 10 years ago on, introduction, on the introduction of computers in schools was linked to the fact that we didn't pay enough attention to this recommendation. What could be the recommendation for successful pilots we have? And you all have successful pilots in countries. We all have successful pilots in Europe. And we have difficulty to see that fully adopted with a large-scale deployment. First, we have to enable legislation to facilitate the new practice. Give you a simple example. Everybody speaks about encourage science-based education. Every science teacher wants to take their students to go abroad or to go uh, uh, outside of the school. And they can't do it because they have no authorization, they must have parental authorization, there is some constraint on legislation and so on. Typical example. It doesn't apply in all countries but that's more or less how it works in plenty of countries. The second element, strengthening the evidence based on new practice. We must have representative pilots. It's absolutely essential in order to demonstrate it can work. Third element, let's empower teachers. Let's empower teachers to take up new practice, which means give time to teachers, and I will come back to that. And then nurturing innovation through networks and privileged community of practice. That's absolutely essential to put the teachers at the center of the process. Of course, there should be a balance between top-down and bottom-up approach. But don't expect mainstreaming processes being prescribed from the central level. Trust teachers and have a large bottom-up, large-scale adoption does work as well. And trust teachers to exchange within themselves. If they see a very nice innovation, they will adopt it if it proves to be useful within their activities. What are the three critical success factors? That's just the slide before the last one. The three critical success factors in any innovation is certainly to make it known. And that's quite important, to have an evidence demonstrating that it can happen. And on that, we don't need now a lot of paper, we don't need a lot of brochures. 
only small videos, two-minute videos demonstrating teachers in action so that other teachers can see that they can do it also. Second element, recognition and time. Whatever you do, we have to award teachers, they have to be recognized, but more importantly, we have to give them time. If you expect that for the teacher to do that on top of the other assignments, it will never work. And finally, it's a political decision. Whatever we do, there must be some courage somewhere to say there is no way backwards possible. A typical example was on the digital textbooks in Canada, in the province. They organized all that, that experimentation, but at the end, the minister of the province said, we stop the paper textbook and we move to the electronic and digital textbook, which means the no way backwards possible is quite an important element for having uh, innovation being mainstreamed. Finally, to finish, I'd like to share with you some elements on what an efficient teacher for the 21st century is. That's a professional with a high judgment capacity in situation. Teaching today is about being a reflective professional teacher. And I invite you to think to something said by uh, somebody from the Stanford Graduate School of Education. The professional teacher is the one who learns from teaching rather than one who has finished learning how to teach, which will make the difference. To conclude, the Future Classroom Lab is more a pedagogical challenge than a technological one. It's a complex issue. We have a lot of obstacles to overcome but it's quite important to continue in the way we are working. Cooperation and comparison between countries is essential, and that's an indispensable laboratory of practice and analysis. And finally, research and evaluation are even more necessary to support and guide a major evolution of our education system. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you, Mark, for this uh, very informative uh, presentation. I think that uh, it takes a lot of time for us to digest all these ideas. So please wait for a little bit uh, for the lunch uh, so that uh, we have time for a few questions. Please. Anna again, yes? Uh, when can we find the mocks uh, for teachers around the Europe? And who has to do it? One of the issues on the MOOCs is, um, is it uh, only a current phenomenon on what is happening at the higher education level? Or is it uh, disruptive? element which will impact in a long-lasting way on how universities and how teaching and learning processes are taking place. We can't know now, but it seems that you, when you saw the comments made by the president of Stanford, or I think Harvard or Stanford, I can't remember, he said one of the major problems on the MOOC is that it's massive and that's open. So, which means it's starting. What we know at the level of European Schoolnet is the, an appetite for learning from all the K-12 teacher community all over Europe. There are a lot of good experimentation coming from European cooperation project. What we only try is to offer these teachers possibility to, to come online, to exchange on that more on a connectivist model, but we are more concerned by not delivering the training. That's not, more a tra that's not a training in the academic sense. We are more concerned offering teachers a way to continue exchanging afterwards for creating a community. That's why, as running the e-training community as a service provider for the Commission, we are pushing with our ministries to the Commission to be a little bit more disruptive and innovative on how we could leverage even more the e-training community by adding more online events for teachers where they can continue to work together. Looking now at the future of MOOC as such, I can't know, but uh, 
there are quite a lot of interesting discussion ar 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 around this phenomenon. In the context of MOOCs, we have, have been participating in, in, in one of the European projects uh, together with European Schoolnet as well, where we are talking now not about uh, MOOCs anymore, but MOOLs. So that the courses are so much predefined, so that maybe it's for teachers and students even better to use massive open online learning, not yeah. predefined courses. Yeah. But yes, we have another question. Absolutely. Yeah, I can't resist uh, a little bit more on the MOOC side. Uh, I'll be talking about it tomorrow. But the original MOOCs were learning arenas. They were places where people with a common interest made a digital environment, got together and investigated questions collaborative, collaboratively. And uh, they were not set, set curricula or set courses that came later, the ex MOOCs. Mm -hmm. so, there are plenty of initiatives. I know I've been on seven, one or two in Sweden. We did one to, with Sweden together with British uh, teachers, helping teachers to learn about how to use digital technology by using digital technology. There, was no, there were no credits. There were no, um, we, it was done by the teachers completely as an arena. And uh, that's a bit, you, there are models. In fact, this model you can copy. You're welcome to copy it. It's Creative Commons and you, just, you, you can use it. And then just start yourself. So mm -hmm. again, it depends what we mean by MOOC. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But also you have to be careful on the MOOC issue. In France, uh, there has been a connectivist MOOC organized. And the most dropouts of the participants was coming from teachers as well. So, which means it's very complex, but now um, the system has to be organized. There must be a lot of evaluation, monitoring on it, but I fully agree that uh, connectivist mode is certainly one to prior prioritize at least when you work with teachers. Okay, I don't see any more hands raised. So, thank you again, Mark. Pleasure. <laughs>